Hello everyone, and thank you for taking the time to come and listen to my defense. Today I will be talking about the development and results of a home energy management strategy for load coordination in smart homes. Now a couple major trends in the residential market are really driving the motivation for this work. First, homes are becoming increasingly electrified with electric smart appliances, electric HVAC, and in many cases, charging of their vehicles. Also, it is becoming more feasible for homeowners to install local renewable energy sources, such as photovoltaic solar panels, and even stationary energy storage batteries, which can help ensure that excess solar power is not wasted. Finally, due to grid resiliency concerns, utility companies in many parts of the country are making time of use and real-time pricing schemes available to homeowners. An example of a time of use pricing scheme is shown on the right, in which the price of electricity is cheapest from about 10 p.m. to 8 a.m., and most expensive when the demand from the grid is highest during midday. All of that being said, it would be advantageous for homes to have a built-in home energy management strategy that is able to minimize the cost of electricity to the homeowners in response to the time of use pricing scheme, while also considering the comfort levels of the homeowners. To achieve this, the HEMS would have the ability to schedule the activation of flexible loads, such as EV charging, dishwasher, and laundry activation. It would also be able to operate the HVAC based on predicted look-ahead ambient temperatures. And finally, it would be able to operate the charging and discharging of a stationary energy storage battery in response to predicted renewable energy generation and that household energy demand. Unfortunately, the relative cost savings in using the home energy management strategy may be quite dependent on a variety of household characteristics. For example, larger households could have a larger roof for additional solar power generation, but may also have larger HVAC costs. Also, the location of the household could play a major role given the extreme differences in ambient temperatures, as well as available solar irradiance. And of course, the size of your EV battery and energy storage will also play a larger role. That being said, an extensive simulation campaign can be used to study these variables and understand how the HEMS performs in each case. With the motivation considered, the contributions of this work was first, the development of a real-time capable home energy management strategy, which is able to optimize the energy utilization considering solar, stationary energy storage, smart appliances, and EV charging. Next, the relative cost savings to the users and other benefits obtained were analyzed in an extensive simulation campaign that also evaluated the influence of different household characteristics, such as location. And finally, to ensure that the HEMS does not significantly degrade the energy storage battery due to some adverse operating conditions, a semi-empirical battery aging model was developed to quickly quantify the capacity fee in each simulation study. Over the course of this work, three papers have been published and presented in various conferences, and another paper is in preparation to be submitted for review in the energy journal. To enable the development of the HEMS, prior work on the modeling of the power in the smart home will be briefly investigated first. An energy balance equation that considers the power consuming and supplying subsystems in the home can be defined. And each of these subsystems are modeled based on the specific house characteristics such as location and house size. First, the power required by the HVAC is determined with a household energy conservation equation. The total power of the HVAC is the summation of the power of the fan, and either the power of the air conditioner or the heater, depending on the season. Second, the power required to charge the EV is dependent on a couple factors. The time of vehicle plug-in is determined by a distribution built from NREL data, and the relative energy needed to charge is determined by data from Carfax as a function of battery size, vehicle efficiency, and ambient temperature. The voltage and state of charge of individual cells is modeled through the zeroth order equivalent circuit model, and the total power for charging is simply calculated as a function of total number of cells in the pack. Third and fourthly, there is power required by controllable appliances such as the dishwasher and non-controllable activities such as cooking or cleaning. The activity of the users throughout the day are defined from the distribution of data obtained from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. Each of these controllable and non-controllable power activities have a predefined power requirement and can be used to build a power demand profile throughout each day. In regards to the power supply, the solar power available can be determined by solar irradiance data from four different cities around the United States, all through 2018. This was obtained from the Department of Energy. The available solar irradiance can be multiplied by the total area of solar panels to determine the free solar power available to the house. 
Next, the energy storage system is technically both a power consuming and supplying subsystem, given that the battery has the capability to be charged either from the solar panels or from the grid, and can be discharged to supply power demand in the house. Similar to the EV charging, the voltage and state of charge of the cells is modeled using zeroth order equivalent circuit model, and the total charging power is dependent on the total number of cells in the pack. Finally, power can be pulled either from the grid to supply any additional power demanded by the household to satisfy the total power balance equation. With that, all of the power within the smart home is modeled, and we can actually begin development on controlling the household. A baseline controller is first defined as a normal use case without any management system. This controller functions with three main principles. First, any activity requested by the user is enabled right away, meaning none of the appliance loads are actually deferred. Second, the energy storage will only charge if there is a surplus in solar power, which is any additional power available after solar panel power demand in the house. And the energy storage will only discharge if the total power demand is not met by the available solar power and if the state of charge is greater than 21%. Third and finally, the HVAC will operate with a simple thermostatic control known as bang-bang control. For example, in the summer, if the household temperature hits an upper bound, then the AC will be turned on until the temperature hits a lower bound. The optimization problem for the household energy management is a mixed integer nonlinear programming problem due to the nonlinearity of the states and the various input control commands that are both discrete and continuous. The cost function is multi-objective to minimize both the electricity cost and the user discomfort. The electricity cost is the time-dependent price of electricity, CE, multiplied by the power consumed from the grid. The deferral cost corresponds to the amount of time that a user has to wait for requesting an appliance to be turned on to when it's actually completed, where CD is a user-defined waiting factor. The temperature discomfort corresponds to the difference in actual household temperature and the temperature set point by the user. Again, CT is a user-defined weighting factor. The problem is subject to state dynamics and state constraints, as well as the power balance equation as defined previously, where P household is the energy uh, demanded by the household except for the energy storage. Additionally, there is a power capping constraint such that the total peak power demand from the house is never greater than 14 kilowatts. The problem is also subject to input constraints. The EV and energy storage charging current is constrained to a maximum and minim minimum defined by the cell specifications. The command for the laundry and dishwasher can of course only be on or off binary input, and the HVAC actually has the ability to be turned on, off, or it's a half load. Finally, the input commands for the deferrable appliances are constrained due to the time of activation. First, none of the appliances can be turned on before requested by the user, known as the enabling time. Second, the appliances must be fulfilled by a certain deadline after requested by the user. Third, the appliances must be turned on for as long at for long enough such that the task can be complete. And finally, the laundry and dishwasher cannot be interrupted once turned on, which is accomplished using a slack variable. The full optimization problem with the complete constraints is now shown here. The states of the system consist of the house temperature, the state of charge of both the EV and the energy storage. The control inputs are the commands for the dishwasher, laundry, EV and energy storage current, and the HVAC command. The external inputs consist of the ambient temperature, the non-deferrable power, the initial state of charge of the EV when plugged in, and the available solar power. The global optimization problem can be solved using monopredictive control to allow for online implementation. With MPC, the optimization problem is solved from the current time step to the end of the finite eight-hour time horizon that is broken up into 10-minute time steps. After the optimal control command is obtained for the entire time horizon, the control command for the next time step is applied and the new states are determined. Next, the horizon is shifted forward one step and the process is repeated until the end of simulation. Given the nonlinearities in the system dynamics, the integer and continuous control variables, and the large number of states and control inputs, solving the optimal control problem in the eight hour time horizon can be computationally expensive. Additionally, because of the goal to conduct an extensive simulation campaign, it is desired to have fast computation abilities. Therefore, in this work, a sequential optimization scheme is proposed at every time step in hopes of reducing computation time. The global optimization problem can be partitioned into three subproblems because of a lack of coupling between the appliances. 
This is true for every subsystem except for the energy storage. Therefore, the energy storage control must be solved in parallel within every subproblem. The first subproblem to be solved is the HVAC because of its required operation at every time step. Next is the charging of the EV because it is predicted that the EV will be plugged in um, almost every day, which is much more often relative to the other appliances. Finally, the laundry and dishwasher are solved last at the same time because they're similar control inputs. Note that the subproblems will take a simplified form of the global optimization problem due to neglecting some of the subsystems. At each time step, the scheme begins by first solving uh, the first sub-optimization problem to minimize the cost function for electricity cost and dis temperature discomfort to find the optimal control command for the HVAC and the energy storage. If the EV is plugged in, then the control command for the HVAC will be held fixed and the second sub-optimization problem will be solved to minimize the cost function for electricity cost and deferral discomfort. Next, if the laundry or dishwasher were requested at that time step, then the optimal control command for the EV charging will also be held fixed and the third sub-optimization problem uh, will be solved to minimize again the cost function for electricity cost and deferral discomfort. Finally, all of the control commands will be held fixed and a capping check will be conducted to determine if there are any times when the peak power exceeded 14 kilowatts. If so, then a taboo appliance will be determined at that time step, depending on which appliance drew the most power. And then the problem will be constrained such that the taboo appliance cannot be activated at that time step. The optimization problem will begin again from that point, and note here that this power capping constraint is not exceeded very often. Many metaheuristic methods have been successfully applied for the problem of online demand side management to minimize multiple objectives. This includes many swarm based intelligence approaches, such as particle swarm optimization. However, it has been found that GA tends to outperform PSO because genetic algorithm is well suited for problems with a discrete finite set of possible solutions. And it also does a good job of handling mixed input types. Therefore, GA was applied in this work to solve each sub-optimization problem. GA begins with an initial set of control commands for the time horizon. During each iteration, the fitness value of each member in the population will be calculated. The members will then be ranked based on their fitness value, and a certain percentage will be selected to be preserved in the next iteration. Of those that were selected, the best will remain unchanged, and the others will mutate. To repopulate the rest of the members, some of the parents will be mixed together in what is known as crossover. To understand the basic operation of the HEMS, a one-day simulation was conducted for both the HEMS and the baseline control strategy. This one-day simulation had the plant model settings of being located in Columbus, the house size of 1,600 square feet, an EV battery size of 60 kilowatt hours, an energy storage size of 14 kilowatt hours, and the energy storage was kept inside such that the temperature of the battery was equivalent to the house temperature. The figure on the left shows a couple major details. First, note the grid time of use electricity pricing scheme on the right axis. Additionally, the baseline power consumed from the grid is in black, and the HEMS power consumed from the grid is in blue. Right away, we can see that the HEMS was able to defer a very large load from a mid-tier price region to immediately after dropping in price. It is also quite clear that the HEMS tended to use more grid power early in the morning before the price increased. Of course, the HEMS will not be able to defer all of the loads to the lowest price region, and its decision making was not necessarily to move everything out of the high price region, but instead to find the decisions that led to the minimum cost. This becomes quite clear when we look at the figure on the right where we can see the distribution of energy accumulated in every price region. The HEMS overall moved the majority of the power from the lowest price region, or to the lowest price region, but it actually took more energy in the highest price region. What is also interesting here is that the HEMS in total took less power from the grid than the baseline. This could be due to multiple factors. First, the more optimal control of the HVAC, but also the HEMS may be more intelligently using the energy storage to ensure that little to no solar power is wasted. Overall, this resulted in a 7% in a price reduction from the baseline. Also, let's quickly note here that the relative cost savings could be significantly higher depending on pricing scheme used. In this case, there's only a 5 cent difference between the highest price and the lowest price region. Furthermore, we can see the activation times of the appliances in the household. First, the vehicle charging corresponds to that large power deferred from the prior slide that we saw. We can see the time of beginning charge started immediately after the low price time began. 
The figure on the right shows the activation of the laundry and dishwashing machine. <clears throat> However, in this case, like many others, only the laundry was activated during this day. We can see that the hems probably could have reduced the electricity costs more by moving the activation right to the end of the deadline, uh, such that it was only activated in the medium tier price time. But of course, deferral of discomfort um, is also considered in the cost function. If users did not care that their appliances were being deferred for such a long time, then they could set the waiting factor lower uh, such that this deferral may occur. Next, we can take a look at the behavior of the energy storage throughout the day in this case. As mentioned from prior, we could see that the HEMS took additional power at the start of the day from the grid. It is clear here that some to most of this power could have been used to preemptively charge the ener energy storage to utilize that energy throughout the high price region in a more intelligent manner. Almost until the end of the day, the energy storage maintains some amount of charge that can be used. That being said, it appears that the energy storage is utilized much greater by the HEMS than that of the baseline. The last operation to consider here is the HVAC. Of course, relative to the bang-bang control, the HEMS is able to keep the house temperature closer to the set point. This results from a much higher frequency of activation and deactivation as shown in the bottom figure. The other interesting thing in this figure is that the HEMS temperature tends to remain slightly above the temperature set point. This may save additional HVAC powering costs rather than using the air conditioning to keep the temperature under the set point given that this is a summer operation. The HEMS controller was evaluated in comparison to the baseline controller in an extensive simulation campaign that investigated a multitude of different house characteristics. In doing so, the relative cost savings, performance, and general operating decisions of the HEMS can be realized. First, the nominal case consists of the same case for the one-day study for a 1,600 square foot house in Columbus, with a 60 kilowatt hour EV and a 14 kilowatt hour energy storage that is kept inside. Then there is a total of 11 other cases that vary the house size from 500 square feet to 4,500 square feet. The location between LA, San Antonio, and Boston, the EV battery size of 25 and 100 kilowatt hours, a variation in the energy storage sizes amongst different house sizes, and finally, the energy storage being stored inside versus outside where the temperature is equivalent to the ambient temperature. A summary of all the case studies is shown here in this table. The top table here shows the relative savings for each of the case studies. In regard to the house size, the savings tended to become greater with larger house sizes. Based on location, San Antonio had the greatest savings, and strangely, this, the cost savings would be expected to increase with larger vehicle battery size, but this was not necessarily true, as seen that the largest battery size had less savings than the mid-battery size. Overall, the greatest cost savings were realized with the largest house size in Columbus, a 60 kilowatt hour EV, and a 28 kilowatt hour energy storage system. Across all the cases, the average cost savings was $162 per year relative to the baseline controller. This is a pretty good amount of savings, but again, these savings could be even greater with a different type of use pricing scheme. For example, in Arizona during summer peak, the difference between high price and low price is 25 cents versus 8 cents with their time of use pricing scheme. A difference of 17 cents versus the 5 cent difference in this pricing scheme that we're using. That being said, it is very important to understand the performance of the system aside from just the cost savings. Therefore, some other metrics can be defined that relate to the ability of the HEMS to defer electric electricity loads. For example, as shown in the top plot, we can see a statistical distribution of the total electricity loads in the house over the course of a single month. From this, we can see that the HEMS did a great job of shifting loads to low price region much of the time. To quantify this deferral ability, two different metrics are described. First, the load flexibility, which is the percentage of the total household loads that are able to be deferred, which in this case is the laundry, dishwasher, and vehicle charging. Additionally, the deferral efficiency can be defined as the percentage of deferrable loads that actually were deferred. These two metrics were analyzed for the house size and location studies. Right away, we can see that the household load flexibility in all cases was near or greater than 60%, and the deferral efficiency was near or greater than 50% in all cases. What this means is that at a minimum, in all case studies, a third of all household loads are being deferred. This is a fairly large quantity of power, and therefore, the performance of the strategy can be confirmed as strong. In regard to the house size, we know that as size increases, the only power that really increases is the HVAC power 
which is essentially non-deferrable. Therefore, it makes sense that the load flexibility decreases. Additionally, it is postulated that the deferral efficiency decreases because a larger amount of power is needed to be committed to the HVAC, and therefore there would be less available solar and energy storage power, which are both major contributors in helping defer loads. The same effect is seen uh, based on location, which primarily affects the amount of available solar and power required for HVAC. For example, in San Antonio, with relatively high ambient temperatures, throughout the year more power is required to cool the house, whereas in Columbus, the power for the HVAC may be less. This is somewhat of a strange balance, given that the increase in heat may also contribute to additional solar power generated. Possibly the solar panels in San Antonio were undersized, relative to the solar panels in Columbus that may have been oversized. Another metric that can be considered is the amount of solar power that is committed to the energy storage system. It was found that as house size increased, the total amount of solar used to charge the energy storage increased relative to the baseline. Therefore, larger house sizes tended to utilize the energy storage system more. With an increase in utilization, it would be expected that the average state of charge of the energy storage would increase. However, this was not always the case. As seen in the bottom figure, the average state of charge was less for the HEMS at the largest house size relative to the baseline. We believe that this can be attributed primarily to the HEMS operation of the HVAC. Again, it is clear that the frequency of the HVAC activation due to the HEMS control is much higher than that of the bank bank control. And from the daytime energy storage state of charge, we can see this frequency carried through, meaning that the energy storage is a primary contributor to powering the HVAC. At smaller house sizes, as shown on the left, the HVAC power is much smaller, and therefore the depth of discharge of the energy storage is less, yielding a sustained high state of charge throughout the day. Whereas the larger house size, as shown on the right, the HVAC power is greater, which corresponds to a greater depth of discharge and a lower sustained average state of charge. So although the average SOC at this large house size may be less than the baseline, the energy storage is still utilized more as demonstrated by the increase of 140 amp hour throughput by the HEMS energy storage compared to the baseline. What this really alludes to is that the energy storage operation is quite variable depending on control, control strategy and plant model settings. Therefore, we must investigate whether or not the HEMS degrades the battery at a significant rate compared to the baseline. Next, we are going to discuss the development of a battery degradation model to determine the total capacity fade for the cases in the simulation campaign. In general, there are two primary types of battery degradation models. First, there are physics-based models, which describe the physical battery aging mechanisms such as SEI layer growth and loss of active material. These models can be extremely accurate, but they tend to lack computational efficiency. On the flip side, there are entirely data-driven empirical models, which in general describe capacity fade due to the battery's cycling aging and calendar aging. While these are quite computationally efficient, they tend to lack accuracy and confidence when extrapolating outside of the calibration region. Therefore, many semi-empirical models have instead been developed, which make key assumptions on the physical mechanisms to improve efficiency and many times require some calibration of physical equations. This type of model is great for our application because we need a computationally efficient model but because there is not much available data for the low C-rate application of residential energy storage, we need to have an increased confidence in the extrapolation. We begin with two primary equations that describe the capacity fade due to SEI layer growth and loss of active material, which have been used in many other works. Within these two equations, there are five calibration parameters, shown in blue, and one more key parameter, theta, which describes the reaction over potential of the cell. Unfortunately, a complex electrochemical model with partial differential equations is required to calculate this value of, electro, of reaction over potential. Therefore, a new calibration parameter was made known as chi, which combines lambda and theta as a single calibrated parameter. This value can then be calibrated at multiple battery operating conditions to find theta as a lookup table rather than solving for it. A new calibration approach was developed for the staging model. First, experimental calendar aging data is obtained at a single operating condition of temperature and state of charge. The new equation for capacity fade due to SEI layer growth is calibrated to this data to obtain KSEI, ESEI, and CHI. Next, KSEI and ESEI are held constant from step one, and CHI is calibrated at additional battery operating points as a function of state of charge and temperature. This allows us to build a mapping of CHI. 
Finally, experimental cycling aging data is obtained and used to calibrate the equation for capacity fade due to loss of active material. At this point, the total capacity fade equation should be used to calibrate here because cycling aging is due to both SEI layer growth and loss of active material. It's also important to note that the assumption uh, we are making on the reaction over potential, uh, that it's a function of state of charge and temperature only. Um, however, it is known that reaction over potential is also a function of C rate. Therefore, during the cycling calibration um, step, application specific current profiles should be used in order to minimize error. The battery model was validated using a C rate of one half, and it was found that the model was a fairly good fit against the data. However, it may seem that the model slightly underpredicts the data, and this may be due to the fact that the calibration data for cycling was at a much higher C rate. The nominal case study data was post-processed using the battery degradation model, and it was found that the total capacity fade amounted to approximately 1.3% for both controller types after one year. Obviously, this is a very similar and minimal capacity fade, especially when compared to the blue line, which corresponds to a calendar aging only case, meaning uh, that the battery is essentially just sitting on a shelf. This minimal fade can be attributed to the fact that the battery seen, uh, sees extremely low C rates in, in residential applications on the order of C over 10. Therefore, the capacity fade due to the loss of active material contributes to less than a tenth of the total capacity fade as demonstrated in the bottom two plots. Overall, across all the case studies, this trend continued with the greatest total capacity fade being just over 1.6% and relatively similar between both the HEMS and the baseline. While there may be concern that we are outside of our calibration range, we can say that this error is almost entirely negligible because it would accumulate within the loss of active material, which is just so minimal in this application. So in summary, an online capable home energy management strategy was developed using a decentralized sequential optimization scheme that was solved using genetic algorithm. An, ext an extensive simulation campaign was conducted to analyze the performance and operational strategy of the HEMS compared to the baseline control strategy for multiple smart home and plant model settings. Next, the semi-empirical battery degradation model was de developed to estimate the relative capacity fade imposed by the HEMS controller compared to the baseline controller to ensure that we are not significantly degrading the battery over time. And it was found that on average $160 per year were saved using our time of use pricing scheme relative to the baseline controller. Additionally, a deferral efficiency of greater than 50% was present in all cases. And finally, neither energy management strategy imposed significant degradation on the battery to cause concern. For future work, we would want to conduct an energy storage and photovoltaic sizing optimization based on home plant model settings such as location, house size, and other settings. Uh, the, the basic question that we'd be asking here is how small of a battery can we use without losing surplus energy from the solar? Uh, in this case, a smaller battery would yield, yield greater C rates um, and in turn greater capacity fade. So therefore, we would want to extend the validity of the semi-empirical aging model at low C rates representative of this residential energy storage operation. Then we can also apply the semi-empirical aging model for real-time control for minimizing the aggregate capacity fate in, rap in, in residential applications and many others as well. Uh, for example, we did a paper on DC fast charging optimization, which used the same semi-empirical aging model. Uh, this could also be applied to onboard vehicle battery management or even for second life batteries. Thank you all for taking the time to listen, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thanks.